But thank you everybody for your prayers. Yeah, I'm back here yeah. today. Um, but um, this is a, this is the Freedom Society lecture that Kuk Jung gave around the country, and um, I just want to we just want to watch a little portion of this, and then uh, hopefully make some comments on it towards the end. Okay. Before the fall, that there were basically four actors. There was God. There was Adam and Eve, and then there were the archangels. This you're familiar with, correct? And so God gave the commandments to Adam and Eve. He taught them what was right, what was moral, how they should live their lives, what they needed to do in order to grow and to mature. And taught them what they needed to do in order to receive the three blessings, how to exercise the freedom. And in the Garden of Eden, he had placed the archangels there as the servants of Adam and Eve. There as servants to help guide Adam and Eve to grow into full maturity and to inherit God's three blessings. But, when, but as we study the principle and the Bible, we know what happened in this story. The archangel, which was supposed to be the servant of Adam and Eve, left his position. He transformed himself from Lucifer into Satan. And in doing so, he seduced Eve and led her into temptation and caused her to fall. And together, the archangel and Eve together then seduced and led Adam to fall. As a result, Adam and Eve lost both freedom and responsibility and they lost God's blessings. And they were separated from God. The archangel went from being the servants of Adam and Eve to being their master and Lord. And Adam and Eve went from being the children of God to being the servants and slaves of Satan. As a result of the fall, humanity has lived under dictators and tyrants throughout most of our human existence. Nonetheless, God has worked through providence to try to restore and bring mankind back to his original position and restore the family of Adam and Eve back to the Garden of Eden. He desires to bring all of us back into the Garden. And that is where we all seek to go. As a result, despite the terrible suffering and tragedy of human history, despite the thousands of years living under tyrants as slaves, humanity has always maintained a memory of the freedom which it had in the Garden of Eden. And as a result, in brief periods throughout human history, we saw glimpses of that freedom expressed. We saw freedom arise brief briefly in ancient Greece. We saw the rise of the Roman Republic, where freedom first for a few hundred years. But nonetheless, as we look at history, freedom is not sustained and invariably dies. Aristotle wrote, republics decline into democracies and democracies into despotism. We know the story of Greece. In, the form, in its initial forming, it was prosperous. People were free. They created new things. They created great wealth. Trade prospered. The city-state grew wealthy and strong. But as the city-state grew prosperous and wealthy and strong, and as democracy progressed, people realized that they could vote for stuff that they wanted, regardless of whether there was any wisdom to doing that action. And as a result of this newfound understanding, the city-state of Greece started engaging in very unwise policies just because the people wanted it. They started a rather unwise war with Sparta, which lasted over 30 years, resulting in their defeat. 
thought they would send colonies out to Italy and other adventures resulted in failure. The result is that they drained their treasury and sapped their strength. And they lost the strength of the state. And they became so weakened that ultimately Greece was, Athens was conquered by Philip II of Macedon. And the free people of Athens went from being free men to being the slaves of their new king, Philip II. Freedom died. The democracy of Greece perished. We saw the similar story in the rise of the Roman Republic. Rome started as a democracy, as a republic, where they had elected officials, and those elected officials made the policies for the state. And initially, Rome was governed with wisdom. But as the Roman Republic continued, towards the end of the Republic, you saw many popularistic policies arise. Land distribution to the poor. The poor felt they didn't get a fair share of the republic. They wanted some. They wanted the state to give them free land. And they voted for it. Give me free stuff. Hey, corn's too expensive. We don't want that expensive corn either. Subsidize it. Give me free food. Cancel it debts. Well, we don't want to pay that back. Let's pass a law to cancel debts. Power-hungry leaders used welfare policies to gain popular support and rise to power. Does this sound familiar to you? We're kind of seeing it every day here in our democracy. Europe's got a big problem with that too. This is 2,000 years ago. And what was the result of all this free stuff? It was the death of the Republic and the birth of Imperial Rome. The Republic of Rome transformed itself from a society of free people into a society ruled by an emperor or a dictator. And the people went from being free men to being subjects and slaves. The freedom of Rome died. <coughs> Democracy perished. You can see modern examples of populism. Perón in Argentina. At the time Perón was elected president, Argentina was one of the ten wealthiest nations on earth. But he came to power promising free stuff to the poor. Populism. And by promising free stuff, squandering the state's resources, he made himself dictator. As a result, Argentina became one of the poorer nations on earth. He destroyed the country. You saw the same thing with the rise of Hitler in Nazi Germany. Hitler expanded the state, militarized the country, built up the arms of the country, got everybody to work. He saved the people from the Great Depression. In process, he made himself a dictator and started killing minorities, killing the physically impaired, gypsies, eliminating freedoms and civil rights. And of course, he started World War II, promising Germans that they would be masters of the world and all the world would be their slaves. And he led the country into ruin. 
and let the world into hell. We see Hugo Chavez in Venezuela, again through populism, rising to power and becoming dictator. You can see the collapse of modern Greece today because of the popularistic policies pursued, the vast expanse of the Greek social welfare state, the expansion of government employment. It has led to the collapse of that state, and now Greece is ruled by the dictatorship of Rome, of Europe. Out of control social welfare spending in southern Europe is destroying the European Union and is leading those countries into collapse. My friends, Europe has a very poor history of maintaining democracy. I mean, look at Italy, Germany. They came out of dictatorship only 60 years ago. Spain came out of the dictatorship of Franco a few decades ago. Greece came out of its dictatorship just 20 years ago. And now it's on the path to being ruled by dictators again. Populism does not end well for freedom. As we know, when we study the principle, we know that God prepares the age. And we know that in order to make the age appropriate for the coming of, and the return of the Lord of Second Advent, he brings up the age back to the period, similar to the time when Adam and Eve were in the Garden of Eden, just prior to the fall. And we call this stage just prior to the, at the top of the growth stage. And so in many ways, the world has been re-prepared to receive the Lord of Second Advent. And so the, Lord, the world, in many ways, has been brought back up to the top of the growth stage. And as a result, when we look around the world, we see that democracies and relative freedom has spread wider and broader than at any time in history before. But when we look at the world, we see that that freedom is not secure. That we have come to a point of decision. We have come to a crossroad where we as humanity must choose our faith. <coughs> Will we unite with the Lord of Second Heaven? Unite with His teaching and His direction and enter together with Him to create the kingdom of heaven on earth and receive God's blessing? Or we as societies and democracies and nations Will we reject the guidance of the Lord of the Second Advent? And in doing so, we take the path which leads to hell and judgment. This is the choice which lies before us today, not just as members of the Unification Church, but as societies which have been blessed by the age was freedom. Where will we go? This is the question which lies before us. All right, guys. Let's give it up one time. Yeah. Yeah. Look it up on YouTube. Look it up on YouTube. It's um, just look up Cook Jin Moon Freedom Society. And you can see the whole one hour video.
for about five days, been bedridden. <coughs> it's been, we have eight kids in this house and they meet hundreds of children a day, so I think, <laughs> right. I think that's how I get these colds. Um, I figured that when I'm outside more, I get less of these colds, but you know, the, you, get the, you get the bug sometimes in winter, and I just appreciate all you guys' prayers and uh, concern. Yeah. Yeah. You know, it, it, during this time, um, you know, uh, I had a new experience, which is quite interesting. I'm sorry today, you know, my wife usually joins me up here, but today I just keep it short. But I had this new experience. I put this up on my Twitter the other day. I just want to share this with you. And uh, this, was, this picture was given to me by Cook Joe. It's pretty obvious. Who did. <laughs> but look at that. Look at that. This is, this is actually one, probably one of the most powerful things I've ever seen. Um, and my kids have seen this too. And I've asked them, okay, here, read that for Dad. Yeah, people who think, you know, you should be able to own guns. And here's George Washington, John Adams, Thomas Jefferson, David. Lincoln, Martin Luther King. Mm -hmm. I didn't actually know that until I put this up and it got such a huge response on <laughs> Twitter. Um, but uh, yeah, he was actually, Martin Luther King applied for a concealed carry permit, but he was declined. Uh, he knew he had to defend himself at that time. Mahatma Gandhi, <clears throat> I looked it up. Go on to the next slide, Shpana. And uh, you know, he, he's in his autobiography made this statement about the British Empire. Um, among the many misdeeds of British rule in India, history will look upon the act depriving a whole nation of arms as the blackest. Mm. Nobody knows this. We never are told this. Mm. We're never told this by conventional media or our schools or um, uh, our institutions, our teachers. Uh, and most of these schools that we go to are often government funded or very liberal who have connections to political figures that you know, uh, support these institutions or whatever. And so many, obviously we didn't hear, I, I, I grew up in a very liberal area. Westchester is not uh, conservative by any means. <laughs> it's a very liberal area. Um, and of course, I was, we, we were trained there. And then I went on to, you know, probably the most liberal institution, which is Harvard. It's probably, you know, it's an elite liberal institution. And it's not like, it's not like anybody is trying to, you know, overtly <clears throat> say to you or, or these kind of things or against these kind of arguments, right? Or, 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 or quote, indoctrinate you with, with liberal ideology. But there is a, there is a sociology, there is an orthodoxy that exists within that culture which sees arguments like this as primitive or sees things that support other things that they don't support as totally irrational, etc. And if you've been in any of these liberal institutions, you know this to be real. If you hold any conservative values, even though they preach tolerance, you will be quickly, quickly uh, blacklisted, so to speak, with peer pressure, etc. And you will be, you will be, you will not feel comfortable in that environment. Anybody, any young people uh, who are in liberal institutes, have you felt this ever before? I certainly felt it. You know, um, in in these institutions. So, one of the things that is quite interesting is that once I put this up on Twitter, I should probably go back to that thing. And um, uh, you know, people who think you should should be able to defend yourself, and people who you think should not defend be able to defend yourself. There's King George the Third and Adolf Hitler and Stalin and <laughs> Mao Zedong and Pol Pot and Kim Jong Il and <laughs> the president. Wow. And it's kind of it's kind of weird that he's giving you the thing. I didn't notice that. That's somebody pointed. That. But, but, uh, they chose a great picture. Okay. Uh, but it's interesting. It's interesting because um, I actually thought, even though I grew up in a house and father, of course, trained all his children. You know, we were from a young age. We had to train in martial arts. Father loved martial arts. He loved these kind of things. Um, we, uh, we were from a young age, we were trained in firearms, all those kind of things. Father trained us to do those things. You know, he loved us to be hunting. But, but personally, myself, <clears throat> I've never been a big hunter. I'm not into that as much. I was into more the martial arts aspect, empty hands, combat, or you know, other types of that kind of martial, traditional martial arts, and um, not necessarily into the firearms as much. And uh, you know, in a lot of these <clears throat> institutions, I felt less pressure. 
If I was a martial artist and I did like traditional martial arts, then I don't, I'm, I don't get that scathing, um, I don't get that scathing response. Oh, you're some kind of, you know, military, you know, uh, conspiracy theorist or something. You know, it's just martial arts. Yeah, you're training yourself, etc. So you don't, and it's closely related to meditation and things like that. But, um, but uh, um, as as we've been having, we've been so blessed because after the service, we have this table here, which I call the Lord's Table Round Table. <laughs> <laughs> we have you guys join in all the time. Ooh, yes. Yeah, the food, but also the discussion there is phenomenal. I mean, what what I wanted to show about well, about what Kukjo has done, particularly, is when I put this up on my Twitter, I usually have just um, unificationists who follow us on Twitter, obviously, because we have a heavy content of unification, this content. But as soon as I put this up, I got all sorts of now non unification <laughs> that started following me. Like these big, even big libertarian organizations started, you know, just following us on Twitter. And so I, I you know, yesterday I was feeling a little better. So I decided, hey, you know what I want to do? I want to put Freedom Society in little tidbits. And I want to put them on Twitter in little tidbits, um, explaining in small, small, you know, phrases. Freedom Society, why principle, why the principle has the answer. Mm. Amen. That's right. Amen. Amen. So I've been doing this, and the more I've been doing this, I've been getting all sorts of followers. Like, you know, some people say they're Muslim libertarians. <laughs> you know, they've got these, I got this, the American uh, for Prosperity Twitter, whole, you know, thousands, they have thousands of followers. They're, they just followed us, and me and Jennifer from Virginia. You know, these people are not unificationists, but they, they can quickly connect Number one, that something's wrong with America, and if America doesn't shape up, you know, the world is in danger. And that, and that the current left wing or right wing doesn't work. It does not work. Because both sides are continuing to, to prop up and build the government, which is, of course, what Jung so brilliantly um, is able to identify as in the archangelic position because it's supposed to be the servant of the people, the children of God, but yet it becomes the master. Amen. Amen. And this is, I think, the most critical point of freedom society. That is actually, if you think about it, it's probably one of the biggest theological uh, breakthroughs in our movement. Absolutely. After the principle. I, I seriously think that because we never had a coherent, a coherent type of political philosophy that could actually change the real world. And, and we're not going to change the real world by simply adopting the popular liberal values that we will get inculcated with wherever we go. We won't do it. We're just going to simply blend into society and, you know, lose our values at the same time. Obviously, we know Father was against that. He had the Washington Times and all that kind of thing. But we were never able to, even though he spoke about headwind, we were never able, never able to articulate it in a way that showed practically what headwind was. What was the actual vision for this? What was the vision that Father talked about for the kingdom of heaven? What he meant when he talked about it is a society without laws. It is a society without ad, uh, lawyers or, I'm sorry, Jim, <laughs> or, or, or lawmakers, these kind of things. Judges, he said, right? And, and Kuk Chang, of course, quotes these things in his speech. He said it's a, it's a society where there will be a peace police and there will be a peace military. When I first heard that, I'm going to be honest with you, when I heard that, I said, what? Peace, but we're in the UN, right? And Father is talking about, there will be a peace police and a peace military. I'm thinking, I'm thinking, oh my God, what are we talking about? I want, you know, can we be a little more like the Dalai Lama or something? You know, it'd be so much, you know, we get accepted so much faster. You know what? And I, I'm thinking, my lord, the peace military, the peace police, what is that? I had no, no idea. So as he says, like he says in his speech, we just did not, we're not able to contemplate that, so we just ignored it, mm. <laughs> which is true. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> Can't understand what, and then what he does is he shows what the approximation of that would be in the real world. So for, he, for example, he gives the example where there's actually no, um, like in the Swiss, Swiss, Swiss military system, or the militia system, or the Israeli mili militia system, 
everybody is a soldier for the nation that will stand up and fight if enemies come in, or, and or everybody is also a policeman. Right? Uh, that would be extended to the police force. So you would need a, a government police, because everybody would be. You see, everybody would already be trained to protect. And in the end, you would trust your neighbor to protect you, you know, more than some guy you don't know, who has, who has, quote, the legal right to have a gun in his holster and your neighbor doesn't. Amen. Amen. So what's amazing about Freedom Society is that finally we were able to um, give a coherent vision that was different from what uh, the right says, was different, unique from what the left says, but has the potential to bring both parts of both sides together to agree on freedom or liberty and responsibility. So there are certain issues that morally we would oppose, like drugs, we would morally oppose, but legally we would not support a government that just, you know, legally does a war on uh, drugs and things like that and builds up their uh, government to do that kind of thing. Amen? We would have to give people responsibility, and just like God does. And so I, I can't articulate it in a way that is, uh, that is uh, uh, at an expert level. But one of the great blessings that we've been able to have for the last couple of weeks is, is we've been able to have this, this round, Lord's Table, Lord's Valley Round Table. Right. And every time I have this, I always tell those guys, you know, Greg's in on it sometimes, Jesse's there, Tanya, and I just like, hey guys, we need to make a radio show. Seriously, I'm telling you. We got to sit around and talk about this stuff. Because it's not only about talking to our members or our blessed families, because our blessed families actually are much larger than we thought. Because Father extended the blessing so much greater than our normal, what we think are our members. Amen. Mm -hmm. And so, we, you know, but articulate something that is totally unique, that is totally uh, 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 headwind, that actually, uh, you know, there's a whole new movement of young people who are now becoming libertarians. And although we may not, we're, we're principalitarians or biblitarians, amen. Uh, in the sense that, because a lot of the young people are realizing with the whole social security system that is that the government has asked people to pay for, but then has used the money for something else, now the young people are going to have to pay for it in the next generation, right? So now the young people are realizing, wait a minute, I didn't, I didn't set this problem up, why do I have to pay for it? Now, so now the young people are realizing yeah. that the current archangelic system does not work. And so that's why there's a whole new trend, intellectual trend, towards leaning towards this kind of approach on both sides of the, of the fence. And this is what I think is so important because usually when we think about church, we think about uh, religion, we think it should be separate from politics or it should be separate from sociology, which it, it actually never can be because it exists within a society, which also politics exists in. And so Father, when you look at his life, he's always been not only a religious figure, but a political figure as well. He's always been advocating things on a political platform as well. And so in that tradition, I think what Kuk Jung has been able to do, which I think is one of the, break, the largest breakthroughs in the principle of understand of principle, because think about the, fun, the conclusion of all freedom society, is that we have to increase liberty and freedom and responsibility for people. And we have to not let government take that away. Think about the conclusion. Now, imagine if he was talking about freedom society and the conclusion was, okay, but everybody, there will be a dictator and the royal family and all of you have to be servants. <laughs> <laughs> that would not be a different story. But his, but his conclusion in the end is that the world needs, just as God gave his yes. children in the beginning, Amen. he needs to give them, the world needs liberty and needs responsibility. Mm. That is fundamentally principle. That's fundamental to principle. Mm -hmm. And so what he's been able to do is use the principle. And, mm -hmm. uh, you know, God has prepared him, I, I, I believe, to be able to articulate something that is so, uh, that it has a potential to impact the next generations. Because, think about it. If we are, if we are just, if we are a community which is just growing, um, you know, a new generation that is simply will be washed away in, in the popular concepts of the day. We're not doing anything to change society, to keep it on track. Amen? But if we're raising a group of people who are smart, intellectual, who know the data. One thing in Buddhism, 
when I study Buddhism, you know, um, they will always quote, the Buddha said that if you have to see, you have to look for your own self, if, if certain things in reality are such. That's why you would practice meditation. You have to see for your own self. Don't believe what I say. You have to see what you, for your own self. And when you look at the data, the actual data, and this is why a lot of people who, who switch from a, a very strong liberal philosophy into a libertarian uh, philosophy, will look at the data on many different aspects of education, healthcare, all those kind of things, which are very relevant to anybody of faith, anybody of no faith, any person who lives in a society. Amen? So for us to be able to now start discussing these perspectives and understand the fundamental position of uh, Archangel and its and certain tendencies, I think is the biggest, it is the probably the biggest advantage that we have in actually being able to change society, yes, to be able to change lives and actually bring America back to where it started, yeah, yeah, yeah. to actually what it stood for, and not the socialism that we've adopted, Amen. which of course will fail. It will absolutely fail. It always fails. So this is one of the great um, joys that I have, uh, you know, working with Kuk John and being with him. He has such an economic expertise. I just been trying to say, you know, hey, we got to make a program, radio program. We need somebody who knows the economics, yes. who knows the real problems uh, of what, why certain things happen, and you know. So, but to be able to have that conversation and to be able to see this through the principle, it started to transform our intellects, transform the way we think about the world, not just by into what you know the secular world tells us and from a very young age tells us, but actually be able to look for ourselves. This kind of thing is a very important thing about, for, about being a unification, especially with our worldview, if we want to change the world, amen? amen? So I found so much joy in looking, I watched this now, I watched this, his Freedom Society thing about two, uh, you know, two or three times in the past couple of days. It is, it is such an insightful thing. I really hope that this is not lost. It's not lost because it's not only about our individual perfection. We've been dealing with such awesome topics last week, remember, and days before about sin and, you know, um, coming to the point of repentance, repenting of our, our sin and repenting that we're sinners before God. Why that's freeing us for us individually, why that brings joy to God. So we've talked about these things. And I think a lot of members who hear me talk will struggle greatly because it's the first time they're hearing these things. But if they work through it, and if they realize that we're not trying to hurt them, we're just trying to get to the reality of it, right? And come to a place of really loving God, not worshiping ourselves, really loving God, making Christ the center of our life. If we come to that point, we're going to see growth in our spiritual life. And I think what's great about the internet is we see so many members who are commenting on our, uh, on our sermons who are, who are expressing that kind of growth, which I'm very grateful for. I just want to give God the glory for that. Amen. can't just stop there. It can't just start, stop with our individual faith. Amen. Or how that affects our family. It also has to go out into how then that influences society. How it influences our politics. How it influences our economy. And of course how, how that faith then plays a central role. And I never knew that faith actually plays the central role to the free society. Because unless your rights are God given, unless the creator, a meta being above and beyond any political system, any human being has given you those divine rights or in inalienable rights, unless you've been given them by your creator, if government has given you your rights, well, they can take it away when the next leader comes in. They can take it away if they gave it to you. Amen? Amen. So philosophically, actually, religion is so fundamental to a free society. So fundamental. That's why you know, uh, God is mentioned and evoked in the founding words and the founding documents because it's the philosophical starting point. Um, no one can, no government authority, no person can say we don't have those rights because God gave them to us, amen? Mm -hmm. And so those, those kind of things are so intertwined. It's not like these are separate disciplines. They're so intertwined um, and it's so real that we, we as the Unificated Church who had the Lord of the Second Advent, who had the Revelation Principle, is, should be able to affect all the arenas of human life and eventually change the world. Build the everlasting kingdom, like Kuk Jinim said. You know? 
And the reason why he, he, he said that we could build the everlasting kingdom is because we have the principle. Mm -hmm. The principle will arm new generations in seeing the real identity of, of the archangel, how he uses government, how, like he said, power-hungry political uh, politicians will promise these things to gain power and get elected, get voted. So once we, if we understand those dynamics at an early age, then we're able to much easier to see through them and to be able to make more uh, uh, rational decisions and or maybe one day we have our young people getting into politics and changing the whole system, amen? Yeah. amen. Changing Washington, yes, you know, and bringing the headwind ideology, bring America back to where God wants it to be. Wow. Yeah. I believe that happens, my God. We're going to see a whole new world. We're going to see if America can get back on track. We're going to see a whole new, you know, yes. uh, uh, an epoch. It's not going to be the age of uh, China in this century. If America can get back on its feet, and it's in big trouble now, <laughs> but if it can get back by some miracle of God, and people waking up, Americans waking up, then again, I believe God can use America to change the world and bring it to God. Amen. Amen. Yeah. Let's give God some glory for this. Man, let's give it up for Jesse. We are so blessed to be this man of God in this hour. Are we ready to praise some more? Let's yes. stand to our feet and give God some praise. Hallelujah. What was that you wanted? God is an awesome God. I don't know if we have that ready.